everyone. Um, welcome to the um, weekly colloquium of, uh, of the Center for Theoretical Physics of uh, Polish Academy of Sciences. Um, my name is Jarek Korbic, and uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our uh, today's guest, uh, Mauro Paternostro from Queen's University of uh, Belfast. And Mauro will uh, show us today a uh, talk on an exciting subject which we started already exploring last week with Chiara Menotti, maybe uh, Chiara Marlotte, pardon, maybe uh, you, you might remember the idea is to apply what we have learned about quantum mechanics through a quantum information theory to the very uh, deep question if gravity has to be quantized or not. Mauro, the ground is yours. Thank you so much, Jarek. Thank you very much for the invitation. And um, thanks to everyone that that, that is uh, so the made, made available their time to to listen to this to this talk. Um, I hope everyone is well. So I'll um, share my screen and uh, see hopefully it will work. OK, can you see my screen? Jarek? Yeah, great. That's great. So I'll go into into presentation mode, hoping that um, the visibility is still good and that you can hear me all right. So um, um, please stop me whenever. Uh, Jarek, let me know if if uh, if there is any any technical any technical issue. So um, uh, this is a as as Jarek mentioned, um, this is a presentation or this is a topic basically merging together an information to get, um, say theoretic take to um, problems related to uh, to the foundations of uh, of, of um, our understanding of, of nature in particular in particular um, if whether or not we can give any insight gather any insight into the potential quantum nature of, of gravity but as you you are going to see the framework that I'll, 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 I'll set up is, uh, is is a bit more general than that. Um, okay, so uh, what am I going to discuss? I'm going to discuss an information theoretic inspired protocol for probing the quantumness of an inaccessible system um, uh, without actually um, having to, to, to do anything on it, but uh, so in an indirect in an indirect manner. Apologies, my, my the, order, the order is not is not right. So then we will um, um, dig into the possible the possible implications. Um, and one of them is um, whether or not it is possible to infer uh, gravity, the quantumness of gravity through, um, through the establishment of, of, of entanglement and its inference based on the protocol that I will illustrate in the first part of the presentation. And, and, um, and finally, say we can, we can dig, if we have time, into the possible quantumness of the gravitational potential, again, looking into, uh, looking into the possibilities offered by uh, the, um, the scheme that I've illustrated, uh, but from a, different, from a different take. So it's not a single, it's, it's a single approach what I will be, um, I will be illustrating. Okay, so let's start without further ado, let's start with probing Probing quantumness without without looking and digging into into the uh, burning question. So, which is which is the key question? So, what that that, that I want to that I want to address. And the situation that I have in mind is a, a sort of paradigmatic. Okay, so suppose that I have a black box. Okay, so a device within it um, which is fully inaccessible. So it's something that I cannot really probe directly. I cannot poke it. I cannot put my finger into it at all. And the question that you are asked is whether or not the mechanism inside the black box, whatever it does, is quantum or not. So if there is any element of non-classicality at some stage in the working principles of the, of the, system, of the system that is within, within, within the black box. And the question is um, theoretically very interesting because it's related to issues of so-called validation, okay? So uh, uh, basically the idea is to validate whether or not um, um, quantum mechanics play, um, play a role in the performance of a given, of a given task or in the, uh, in the, uh, say in the evolution of a, given, of a given system in, in, the, broad, in, the, broad, uh, in the broadest possible sense. And experimentally, this is growing in interest, in particular in the domain of uh, developing quantum 
quantum technology. So uh, if you're familiar with uh, um, either technically or, or uh, just by reading, say, maybe, maybe um, um, uh, specialized specialized articles on the topic of quantum technology, uh, you might have, uh, might have found that um, say putting your fingers on fragile quantum, quantum experiments is not necessarily something that you would like to do. Uh, quantum systems, as we know, are incredibly prone to lose their special nature or their special characters due to um, any external intervention. So any poking activity might infer in a detrimental manner, in an in a, in a unwanted way, with the uh, fragile quantum properties that I would like to exploit for my, for my task. Yet validating whether or not a given device is indeed um, behaving quantum mechanically is, is extremely important because it will, uh, it will provide me the tools with us, you know, for ascertaining the potential advantages that quantum technology might, technologies might have in the, in the performance of a given, of a given scheme. Um, those, those of you that have heard of the D-Wave machine have very much likely understood already which is the which is the issue that is a complicated system was quantum nature is not necessarily uh, is not necessarily granted and and it is important to devise ways to experimentally validate the possible quantumness of that of that uh, of that process okay how do we how do we address this question. So let me set up the general, the general setting, the general framework, um, which will be relevant for the rest of the of the discussion or most of it. So I'm going to to uh, put my my attention um, into a tripartite system. So a system composing composed of three individual individual parties. The center, the guy in the, at the center is what I'm calling C in this slide, is the object that is inverted commas inaccessible and was quantumness. I am interested in. Um, and moreover, I'm, I'm, I'm not say, being particularly prescriptive in terms of the of the complexity, so to say, of the of the device that I want to probe. So I can my my and, and my conclusions will be valid um, for an elementary system such as a two level system, for instance, right? So uh, an individual, uh, the most elementary, uh, uh, um, say, uh, information information carrier that you can think of, a two-level system as being one half-like particle, or a many-body system, all the way up to mesoscopic systems. And indeed, that will be, in a way, uh, the, um, a preferred, the preferred scenario that I'm going to, to, um, to tackle later on in this presentation. Now, C, the guy that I want to, to probe and address, is sandwiched by two, uh, by two more ancillary systems, A and B. Uh, which are my Trojan horses, uh, the, two, the two guys that I'm, I'm going to, uh, to access. And uh, what I'm, I'm doing is that I'm allowing for bilocal interactions between C and each of the two, of the two individual ancillaries, A and B. So there is an Hamiltonian of interaction that regulates the evolution, the joint coupling between A and C, and B and C respectively. But there is no direct connection, there is no interaction, direct connection between A and B. Um, moreover, um, just because I want, to, I want to build up a scenario that is as realistic as possible, I'm going to allow for the possibility of each of these systems to be interacting with its own, its own environment, its own local environment. So um, I will allow for A, B, and C to undergo a non-unitary dynamics uh, but what I'm, this is the, one of the one of the key assumptions on, on of my framework. Um, I will exclude explicitly the possibility for these environments to be non-local, so to be connecting the two part two of the of the of the three systems or more of these of these uh, two or more of the systems that I am I am um, I have attained. So there are local environments. This is a good approximation in many in many scenarios. And in order to comply with the general setting that I have, uh, I have established at the beginning of the presentation, I'm assuming that particle C or system C is within a cage. By that, I mean, with that, I mean that um, I will not be allowed to, to touch it, to, to, to probe it, to measure it at all, while I'm allowing myself the freedom to do what I want to particle A or to system A and system B, including the luxury, so to say, of reconstructing the state of A and B uh, 
um, whenever needed and, um, and, and um, as best as I can. Okay, so I can reconstruct, I can gather information on a MB. I can poke the state, I can tweak the state, but I cannot do virtually anything on, on C altogether. And this is already a very constrained scenario that fits very well with the, with the, with the general question of validation that I have illustrated um, uh, a couple of slides, slides ago. And that will, will be sufficient to, um, to put together the results that I want to, that I want to illustrate. So what is my, my goal? My goal is uh, to determine, I've said it already a couple of times, whether or not the inaccessible system, the guy in, within the cage is in, is non-classical, is making use of um, non quantum mechanics for its working. What is the tool that I'm going to that I'm going to use is the entanglement gain. So is the possibility that two non-interacting systems, A and B in the slide before, gain entanglement mediated or through the, the say, respective interaction with the inaccessible, the inaccessible system. Um, what is the result that I, I hope to, to, to deliver? Is that such a gain in entanglement, so A and B will become entangled, if and only if, during their evolution, the inaccessible system that I have, um, um, I want to probe, um, evolves towards a, a non-classical state. So if an element of non-classicality is implied in the dynamics, in the uh, tripartite dynamics of my, of my system. Okay. What does it mean? Evolves towards a quantum, a quantum state or a non-classical state? The inaccessible state system should be in a state so at some time of its dynamics um, that requires non-orthogonal elements, non-orthogonal components for its for its description. And those of you that are familiar with the um, um, uh, notion of non-classicality entailed, for instance, by quantum discord, and I'm going to, to, to get into, into that in a second, um, might have sneaked already the fact that this is a strong, a strong element of non-classicality wherever, whenever you are interested in quantum correlations and the characterization of quantum correlations ensuing from quantum dynamics. So the need for non-orthogonal components in the description of the state of the inaccessible party of my composite system is the element of non-classicality that I'm going to put my finger upon. Uh, Yarek, are we still okay in terms of, of, of um, see quality of, of sound? That's great. Okay, so the results that I'm, I'm, I'm going to illustrate are um, up to ca characterized by the following slide. And um, I'm a simple-minded person, so uh, I like diagrams to to illustrate concepts because this is the way I can, I can understand them. So let's see what is, what is the main take home message of these uh, say, approach to the characterization of non-classicality in this constrained, constrained scenario. What am I going to do is to illustrate a, a result that has been uh, put together uh, a few years ago, so in 2012, uh, 12, by a bunch of people, including, including myself, uh, genuinely international collaboration. So there were people, people working in Singapore at the time and people working uh, in Europe and in Canada. So uh, um, a, a, genuine, uh, a, genuine, a genuinely say, worldwide collaboration of people independently interested in the very same so, so to say, the bunch of names that you see in that reference down there developed an interest in this question at different times and different points in space, and then condensed the interest in in um, in a very in a very serendipitous manner. Anyway, so uh, uh, um, um, it's a funny story. Anyway, so um, let me um, uh, let me gather let me say put my attention on a system A and B, and these guys are remote. They are not interacting. They are not connected through any mechanism apart a mediator C that is by locally interacting with A and then B. Okay, so you might recognize elements to the situation that I've illustrated before in my in my say general general setting general constraint uh, um, um, slide. So what I'm allowing is for C to be able to interact with A, and then only subsequently, so only after that, um, C will be allowed to interact with particle B or with subsystem B. And my question is whether it is possible for A and B 
to become entangled through the action of C without having C entangled at all at any instant of time, okay, with either A or B. So the question is, can I entangle A, entangle A and B without involving in any quantum mechanical manner correlations with C? What one would be um, uh, pushed to, to claim is that, um, say, if C mediates the interaction between these two remote particles, there is a difference in the amount of information, so to say, contained in the state uh, of A over the state of B, or vice versa. And this difference is basically dictated by how much information C is able to transmit to B on A right through the interaction. So C is a messenger, gathers information on A, transfers it to B. If we are talking about a genuinely quantum mechanical situation, this exchange of information might result in the tripartite entanglement or in some entanglement anyway, uh, between A and B. The expected statement is that if A and B at the beginning were not entangled and they are entangled at the end. Well, this difference in entanglement might be arising only from the entanglement that C is able to establish with A and B and share with A and B. Yet this is not the case. In fact, what one can prove, and this is what is proven in this 2012 paper, is that the actual object that gets into play in the establishment of entanglement between A and B separated and not interacting along the ways of the general scenario that I've illustrated here, it's only a more general form of quantum correlations than entanglement. And this more general form of quantum correlations is the discord, it's called quantum discord, shared by C with either A or B. What is discord? is nothing else but a weaker form of quantum, for the sake of this discussion, it's enough, is a weaker form of quantum correlations um, that goes beyond the boundaries of a classical, say, a classical description of, of correlations, but is not coincident, is not equivalent with entanglement. Is the property of mixed states, even, my, even highly mixed states of, of systems of general general dimensions. It is formulated, um, 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 say, operationally in a number of beautiful papers produced in the last, probably in the last 10 years. For what matters us, so for what concerns us, um, uh, what is sufficient for us to, to know is that the gain in entanglement between A and B is upper bounded by the presence of quantum discord involving C. And now those of you that have worked on quantum discord know exactly that discord arises whenever in the description of state of the state of particle C, you need non-orthogonal states. So this tails perfectly with my requirement for non-classicality. So this is the ingredient that I need in order to ascertain the non-classical nature of particle C. So what I'm going to, to, uh, to do is to make use of the result dated back in 2012, this upper bound to the amount of entanglement gain between non-interacting systems, uh, upper bounded again by the amount of discord that they are able to share with a mediator. So with the necessity for particle C to have non-orthogonal components in the description to state that the entanglement gain, okay, uh, in this quantum, it's a quantum communication protocol is basically strongly dependent on the amount of non-classicality that C is able, to, uh, is able to support, to sustain. Let's go back to, to, my, to my scenario, okay? So the 2012 situation was propedeutic to the result that I want to make use in order to ascertain the possible non-classical nature of, of gravity. And what I'm going to state is, is precisely, say I'm making use of precisely the results based, dated, dating, back into, dating back to 2012. So in the general setting that I've illustrated a couple of slides about before, the gain between A and B in terms of entanglement will only be possible if C is at some instant of time in the evolution of the tripartite system in a non-classical state 
entailed or uh, implied by the presence of non-orthogonal components in, in, its, in, its, in the description of its, own, of its own physical configuration. So only if I get that, if and only if I get that, uh, I get that element of non-classicality in the state of C, I will be able to um, measure, to detect, to reveal entanglement between A and A and B. And in fact, this can be can be um, can be formalized in a in a very rigorous manner. And this was done in this paper in 2017 um, 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 in collaboration, prepared in collaboration with the group of Tomek Patrick. At that time, um, uh, Tomek was was at Nanyang uh, Technical University in Singapore, and uh, I believe he's now in Dansk, and uh, so he's, he's closer he's closer to your to your to your to to, to you guys. A bit closer than you guys to, to you guys. So um, the question that we uh, that we uh, we ask is whether entanglement indeed between A and B can be created or increased if there was any entanglement. So if any entanglement gain is possible when C is classical. Okay, so I want to just ascertain whether or not there is any possibility for a classical C to mediate the entanglement gain. And the answer is no. There is no way in which a classical C along the lines of my definition of, of classical versus non-classical states mediates an entanglement gain. And this has been formulated in this 2017 paper in the form of a theorem, stating that if you have the general conditions that I have illustrated before in my, in my I'll say, general condition terms and conditions light, so this tripartite system with only bipartite interaction, there is no entanglement gain if the discord with C is zero at all time, which means if the state of C remains classical at all times in the evolution, um, following the definition of, 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 of non-classicality that I have, that I have, um, I have introduced before. And this puts us in a perfect position to study the potential non-classical nature of C from the observation of the entanglement between A and B only. And I remind you, I have allowed myself the possibility and the freedom to reconstruct the state of A and B whenever I want. So I will be able, I'm assuming, to be able to reconstruct the entanglement that A and B share potentially um, in, a context, in a context such as the one that I have, I have, I have discussed so far. OK, let's move to a little bit more concrete situations. OK, so so far I've illustrated somehow the tool that I want to make use of is this entanglement gain between, between non-interacting systems to ascertain the potential non-classicality of an unaccessible party. How can I match or which will be a realistic situation that matches the, situ the, the, the condition, the general conditions that I have, I have introduced at the beginning? I work a lot in a field called optomechanics, which is the, uh, the area of light matter interaction that um, uh, um, somehow addresses the question, what happens when I have a light field driving the motion of a mechanical system? Okay, so think of a mechanical harmonic oscillator. Um, was vibrations, was oscillations, are driven by uh, an optical drive? Okay, so I can shine light on a light enough mechanical system and put it in vibration in light of what is called radiation radiation pressure, right? So uh, light carries momentum. Um, when light impinges on a, on a system, it transfers momentum to it. If the system itself is able to vibrate or is able to, to oscillate in, in, in the way of, a, of an harmonic oscillator, then the vibrations of these systems will be driven by the, by, by the optical part, by the optical drive. What happens when the field uh, driving such, a, such oscillations is a quantum mechanical field? And uh, so it's in a, in a quantum state. And what happens if the mechanical system that I'm con considering is small enough and light enough to enter somehow the domain of quantum mechanics? Am I driving the oscillations of a quantum mechanical oscillator? Is the radiation pressure dynamics uh, or coupling able to impart non-classical features in the dynamics of a mechanical oscillator? These are questions that in the field of optomechanics are key essential and are um, actually at the, at the core of a very intense experimental activity in, in quite, a few, quite a few labs, labs in the world. Um, I had the privilege to work with some of them, uh, but um, for the sake of the discussion that I want to, I want to push today, 
um, I want to focus on a very specific configuration. So I have a fabriperal cavity, right? So a cavity, an optical cavity with fixed mirrors with a vibrating membrane in the middle, okay? So this is the movable mirror that you see at the center of this, of this horrible drawing. This is the harmonic oscillation. Those vibrations will be driven by the cavity field, right? I'm populating the cavity field with light and that um, couples to the mechanical oscillator driving its vibration. Now, the fact that I have a membrane in the middle allows me to basically um, identify two subcavities, a left one and the right one, one driven by the red colored field that you can see and one driven by the blue colored field that you can see in my drawing. These two fields are not interacting. The membrane is highly reflective. There is no light leaking from one subcavity to the other one. So there is no way in which field A feels the presence of field B directly. If there is any interaction between field A and field B, that might be mediated only by the movable mirror in the middle, which I cannot probe. If you have ever seen an optomechanical experiment, or if you have ever spoken to an experimentalist working in quantum, in, in quantum optomechanics or in cavity optomechanics, they will tell you never, ever, ever put your finger on the mechanical oscillator or touch the mechanical oscillator because you ruin my beautiful experiments. And that's hundreds of thousands of, of years of experiments um, wasted. So you don't want to put your fingers on the mechanical oscillator. What you want to do is to probe the light field. So again, if you work in a more abstract, at a more abstract way or more abstract level, you will see that this situation and say fits perfectly with the abstract and dry situation that I've illustrated at the beginning. I have an object that I don't want to touch, the guy in the middle, the membrane in the middle, that is interacting with two otherwise non-directly interacting systems, the two cavity fields, which I can probe, poke, measure, detect, and do whatever I want. Upon. So the question is, can I see a non-classical state of the membrane in the middle of the movable mirror through potential entanglement gain between the two fields, A and B, that have interacted with it through radiation pressure? And the answer is, is indeed yes. I mean, if you, if you start looking at the, at the entanglement that you generate between the two cavity fields in time, you see that you gain a bit of, of such entanglement. Here we have a few simulations for different initial temperatures of the thermal state of my mechanical system. The mechanical system is in contact with its own, its own bath of phonons. Uh, it's a ter in thermal equilibrium with such a bath of phonons before it interacts with the mechanical with the optical fields. Uh, the larger the temperature of such bath of phonons, uh, the more classical the nature of the vibrations of this mechanical system. Uh, yet you can see that despite no, a growing temperature in going from the black to the green line, the growing temperature in the initial state of the mechanical oscillator, I can see entanglement established in time between the two optical fields. And actually this entanglement is rather robust. It persists at long time limit, right? So in a steady state um, and is there for me to be able to measure it, to detect it, and therefore to infer the non-classical nature of the, mechanical, of the mechanical system. And in fact, if I check if there is any discord between the mechanical system and the cavity field, so if indeed an element of non-classicality was involved in the dynamics of the mechanical system in, in the situations illustrated in the leftmost panel, I do find that at some point in time in the dynamics of the mechanical oscillator, there was some non-classical correlation. So there was an ingredient of non-classicality needed for the description of the state of the mechanical system. So the criterion of or the inference of non-classicality through this inaccessible, inaccessible uh, or this entanglement gate seems to be working. And there are other options Actually, there are other systems in, out there that you can play with based on the criterion that I have, I have illustrated before. For instance, you can look at, into a chain of magnetic spins, um, like the topmost uh, 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 drawing that you see, you see in this slide. So this is an experimental situation. I mean, the cartoon is not, but it shows the scheme for an experiment that has been performed in this paper in 2015, where these guys in the lab were interested 
in determining whether or not the two red colored spins that you see at the end of the chain were entangled, were entangled by the bulk, okay, through the bulk, the chain that were of, of magnetic spins that were, were, were in between. And the answer is yes. And when you plug my framework for the indirect inference of non-classicality through entanglement gain, what you see is that the two end spin are entangled whenever the bulk of the chain is in a non-classical state, again, in terms of quantum discord with the two end spins. A third example is provided by quantum dots, and this is the, top, the bottom most uh, drawing or, or scheme that you see at the, in the slide, showing three quantum dots, the smaller, the smaller dots in the, the smaller circles that you see in the drawing, are uh, interacting with a larger dot, the larger circle uh, uh, slightly above them. And, and, and what you can see is, again, that the two uh, end dots, the leftmost and the rightmost one, get entangled whenever the interaction with the largest one is, um, implies, implies the, establishment, the establishment of some discord. And these are experiments that have been performed um, in the lab. So there are, there are concrete situations where the, the, the criterion can be, can be put at stake. Now, verging a little bit more towards visionary perspectives. Okay, so I'm, I'm getting to, the, to, to gravity in, in, the next, in the next slide. But before doing that, let me be, uh, I say, growingly crazy and growingly visionary and, and, and um, uh, put on the plate the possibility to um, ascertain the possible non classical nature of biological settings, biological systems through the criterion that I have established. Okay, so the green guys that you see in this slide are green sulfur algae that one can, can um, indeed put in cavities. It has been done in a, a couple of beautiful pioneering experiments performed in the last three or four years by, by the group of Coles, if I'm not wrong. Um, and these guys have been able to basically perform spectroscopy uh, of, the, of, the, um, of the biological sample that they have inside an optical cavity, um, uh, interacting with a multi-mode field. So you can drive an opti the, op the optical cavity that is coupled to the, to the biological sample through a multi-mode drive, driving field, populating the cavity. And your question is, can I ascertain whether or not the biological sample within my cavity is in a quantum mechanical state? And if I do, uh, or if I can, how can I do that? And the answer is precisely going along the lines of what, uh, uh, what my indirect probing mechanism would then take. If you pick up pairs of modes of the multi-mode drive that populates the cavity, and you wonder whether after the interaction with the, with, the, with the algae, such modes develop entanglement. The answer is that for the numbers that these guys have in the labs for these green sulfur um, 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 algae, um, you indeed get entanglement. You might indeed measure entanglement between optic uh, output modes. The rectangle, the black rectangle that you see in this diagram, which shows the amount of entanglement between pairs of of, of modes is a point that we estimate these guys in the lab should be able to see if they were able to measure of, if they were going to measure the entanglement. May I interrupt? May I interrupt? Of course, please, please, uh, hello. What's entangled with what in these two uh, optical modes? Okay, so um, it's quadrature entanglement. So okay. you are looking, you are looking at um, a, a Gaussian scenario. I, I, stop me if what I'm going to say doesn't make sense, but your dynamics is basically a Gaussian, a quadratic dynamics, and you can characterize the entanglement in terms of correlations among the statistics of quadratures of the cavity fields. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So you're welcome, more than welcome, and thank you for your question. Uh, so the dot, the, the the black dot there is our estimate of where the experiment would be would be uh, if they if they used our our criteria. Okay. Now let's make use, avail, leverage on the results that have been illustrated to infer or to start wondering whether this criterion can be used to infer the potential quantum nature of gravity. So I go back to the situation that I have illustrated at the beginning. So my system C um, um, caged, interacting with two, non, say two parties that I want, I, I want to, 
I want to infer. And I know I'm putting the two, the two particles, the two uh, Trojan horses that I want to use in a different form of a cage, okay? So what I want to do is to shield them from any other possible interaction between them, such as surface forces, uh, indirect, sorry, Van der Waals forces due to proximity and so on. So what I want to do is to make sure that particle A and particle B interact, if they interact, only through a gravitational mean. Okay, so that's my constraint. I have something in between, and this something in between is the potent is the gravitational field, and I'm working under conditions that um, somehow entail that the only thing that matters is the gravitational potential or the gravitational interaction between A and B. And my question is, can I make use of my criterion to establish whether or not such an interaction um, is quantum or is non-classical? And this is a question that has been addressed in a few, in a few, in a few works uh, recently. And to, to the best of my knowledge, the first one that um, addressed the question um, explicitly was this PRL paper in 2017. And then again, working with Tom McPaterick Tom and its group. Um, and this group, we have, we have explored the question, the question, the question further. Okay, um, let me state that um, currently we have a huge body okay, of, 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 of literature on the theory of, of quantum gravity. Um, um, some dead ends have been met so far, some inconsistencies have been, have been, have been found. To my knowledge, and I'm not an expert, but to my knowledge, um, there is no theory of quantum gravity uh, that is supported empirically or uh, by, 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 um, by experiment or by experimental evidence. We have um, uh, um, um, say a bunch of beautiful theories that um, um, somehow have missed the opportunity to be verified experimentally. And, and maybe the reason why um, um, we face this, uh, um, these difficulties is that we have looked at the possible quantum nature of gravity in, in the wrong way, or in a, in, say, not in, the, in, in, a perf in, a, in a perfectly efficient manner. I stress I'm not after a theory for quantum gravity. I'm after the possibility of drawing and then implementing an experiment that is able to ascertain the potential quantumness of gravity. Okay, so I'm not here to quantize gravity. I'm here to, to somehow to suggest a possibility for the inference. Needless to say, experiments aim at ascertaining the non-classicality of gravity have been put forward. One of them in the, in the past, one of them that resonated a lot with the, with the, with the, with the, with the, with the community of optomechanics and light matter interaction um, was the one in nature physics in 2012. Uh, involving involving uh, experimentalists in Vienna and the group of Czaslav Bruckner, where these guys were basically interested in uh, verifying the possibility for non-classical nature of gravity through possible deviations uh, on or modifications of Heisenberg uncertainty uncertainty principle. Uh, I'm not going into into the details of this of this proposal. Other proposals have been put forward in the past. Uh, some of them are, are, are there in, in these slides. Many I'm, I'm forgetting or I'm not mentioning. And I apologize already with, if you have been involved in any of those and I have, I'm not acknowledging them, the field is growing quite, quite substantially or quite fastly and, and it's difficult to keep track to keep track of the progresses. But all these experiments here are basically um, um, uh, I have a basic commonality, which is that of an indirect test of quantumness, so uh, of, of gravity. So the, the, the potential influence that a quantum theory of gravity would have in the prediction of the statistics of the dynamics of a given, of a given system. So they are all pointing towards, towards the same effect. And they're all building, in a sense, on the proposals of these two of these two PRL papers. I spoke already of the paper by authored by Sugato Bose, and of which I was was part, and there is also an independent, an independent assessment and proposal by the group of Vlatko Vejal uh, with Chiara Marletto, uh, published back to back in, in PRL in 2017 with the paper by, by, Bose, by Bose et al. And I'm going, just because I, I understand it, it was my work, so I, I should understand it a little bit better, I'm going to illustrate the proposal by Bose et al in 2017. 
And the idea is precisely that of a entanglement mediate, sorry, of a, of a entanglement gain mediated by the quantumness, by the quantumness of, of uh, the possible quantumness of, of, uh, of gravity. So suppose to have two massive systems, M1 and, and M2, two particles undergoing a form of, say, uh, um, uh, matter wave interferometer, okay? So you let these two guys being trapped at the beginning, and, and you let these two particles have an, 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 an internal spin degree of freedom, okay? So not only they can move, but they also have an internal degree of freedom, a spin, that you can arrange, what state you can arrange. Um, what you do is that you release one of these two particles and you subject it to a magnetic field that has a special gradient, okay? And this gradient is such that the wave packet of the particle falling inside this um, especially inhomogeneous magnetic field is basically split in two branches depending on the value of the spin of the internal degree of freedom, okay? Of, of, of the internal spin degree of freedom. So if the spin is up, then the wave packet of the particle will be deviated towards the left. If the spin is in down, then you have a deviation uh, to the right induced by the interaction with the magnetic field. And that arranges for a form of, stern, of sorry, of, of uh, um, interferometer, right? So Max Zender-like interferometer, if you like, where the two branches of the wave function are then re built together, not re-put together at the output of the region of, uh, outside the region of inhomogeneity of the magnetic field. Great. You do it now for both particles, for particle M1 and for particle M2, and they are initially separated by a distance d, okay? So what happens is that you have configurations where either the two particles are very close together or they are very far apart, or at, the, at, a, at an equal distance, if the particle on the left is no, moves towards the right and the particle on the right moves towards the right, right? Or vice versa, okay? So you have four different possible configurations. Now what you do is that you use spin eco techniques, for instance, to create a superposition of spin states at the beginning. So your spin degree of freedom is in a coherent superposition of spin up and spin down for both particle one and particle two. So what happens in this case is that the four branches of the dynamics, so close together, far apart, or at the same distance, left and right, occur at the same time. And if you do the calculation, what happens is that you see that the initial wave packet, okay, which is initially separated from the spin degree of freedom, spin degree of freedom being prepared in initial superpositions, get entangled, oh, apologies, uh, uh, too fast, get entangled um, uh, with the spin degree of freedom during the dynamics, okay? Because they, they get correlated, spin up, leftmost, spin right, rightmost. But there is the pathway that the two particles follow where they get close together, where the effect of the gravitational interaction will be magnified, will be much stronger than the effect that the gravitational interaction would have at the end sorry, if they are far apart. While the effect of gravitation is canceled in the two equal distance, equal distance, same distance uh, path. In the end, what you get is that starting from a separable state of the spin degrees of freedom, both are prepared in a coherent superposition, but they are separated from each other. They are split from each other uh, because, because of the preparation that I, I have arranged. I end up with a state of the two particles where the external degrees of freedom are split, are separated from the internal degrees of freedom, but the internal degrees of freedom have or share an entanglement that is induced by the potential gravitational interaction. So you do get, uh, you might get an entanglement gain in light of the description, the potential gravitational interaction between the two quantum mechanical systems entailed by the by the two, by the, the internal degrees of freedom. Okay, this proposal has been the subject of um, an, quite an extensive body, body of literature highlighting the difficulties in the implementation, um, the um, um, possible uh, pathway or roadmap towards, towards its implementation in the lab. It seems a feasible experiment as um, revealed 
uh, by, by even, even very recent experiments, I mean, some of, sorry, not experiments, but assessment. Uh, the papers that you see here are not, they back a few months ago, some of them are probably a month old. Um, um, and, and they all point towards the, the possibility to you make use of this criteria or this methodology for the inference of, 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 of gravity, in use, gravity in use and tangle. And with Tomac, uh, with Tomac, what we did uh, was making use of a similar approach where we had two mechanical oscillators, um, um, these two particles, these two gray box, um, uh, balls that you see there, driven, was dynamics is driven by two fields, two optical fields, along the lines of the experiment, of the thought experiment that I have illustrated before on, on the possibility to reveal the non-classicality of a mechanical system through light matter interaction in the form of an optomechanical system. And now the two particles, the two gray ball, are supposed to interact only through gravitational potential, okay? So the interaction is through, yeah, a free Hamiltonian, plus a term, a coupling term, that is of a gravitational nature. What we did was expanding this gravitational potential in, C, in power Cs and focusing on this term here up. So truncating our, our, our say, approach, our, expand, uh, say, yeah, our expansion up to this, to this, to this term. Um, yes, yeah, so you can stop there if the distances between the two particles is, is large enough. Um, but this uh, gravitational potential is Newtonian, yeah? That is Newtonian, precisely. You are, you are testing the Newtonian. Yeah, yeah, of you, course, you, but yeah, yeah. this is not gravity. Gravity it's gravitational is, a, potential. is a gravitational field, and there are no instantaneous interactions. Therefore, absolutely. Gravity. You, are, you, are, you, are absolutely, you are absolutely right. We are, we, are, uh, we are probing, so to say, the static part of it. You are absolutely, absolutely right. So um, the, the point is here that um, this second order term generates coupling that of, the squeezing, of the squeezing form, of a squeezing form, that might generate indeed entanglement between the two particles. And this is indeed, I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll skip. I'm conscious of time. Am I right, am I right Yark? I, I have um, a few more minutes before, before questions. A couple of them, yeah? Well, uh, yeah, yeah, I can give you up to 10. That's that's fine. I, I'll probably not need. Yeah, I'll okay. probably not need not, not need ten, 10 full minutes, but that's all right. Let's so, make um, it seven then. <laughs> okay. So the interaction between uh, between um, between them is um, um, the squeezing term induced by 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 um, by the Newtonian the Newtonian interaction, and um, and this gives rise indeed to some entanglement. Entanglement that is indeed magnified or uh, made pushed up to the level of see the possibility for observing it experimentally um, uh, when you prepare the oscillator, the mechanical oscillator, in special states, okay, in squeeze states. So the possibility of localizing initially the wave packet is indeed is indeed uh, useful for the sake for the sake of revealing the effect. And and we did more. We went to uh, the possible um, um, plugging in of the effect of the environment. So you want to, you want to test the possible, the possible robustness or how much robust this interaction, this effect is uh, when you plug in, when you plug in an environment. And um, I'm going to bypass the technical aspects. What, what I want to, what I want to stress is that the dynamics of these two mechanical oscillators, or the, the again the quadrature of these mechanical oscillators, is um, um, regulated by a linear equation um, uh, where I have a vector of quadratures. Whose dynamics is induced, so is uh, again ruled by uh, this kernel matrix. This kernel matrix that puts together the interaction, the strength of the interaction. Um, that I'm allowing between them, the natural frequency of the particles and the possible decay of the mechanical excitations in the particles into an environment. Um, what this L vector entails is, a, is basically nothing else but a vector of stochastic noise, like Brownian noise, these guys are exposed, mechanical oscillator are exposed to a non-zero temperature and perform naturally Brownian motion. And, and kappa here is just a constant term that enters into the dynamic. The dynamics can be solved analytically. I mean, um, uh, up to some, up to certain extent. Um, the dynamics, the, the the quadrature, the dynamics in time, the evolution in times of the quadrature can be tracked, and you can infer the amount of entanglement that you are able to uh, witness between between the two 
between the two, uh, the two objects, uh, between the two mechanical oscillators. And what you get is that indeed, depending, needless to say, on the, na on the thermal nature, on, on the number of thermal excitations within the state of the two mechanical oscillators at the beginning, and depending on the operational conditions, on, on, on your conditions, your experimental conditions in the lab, you will be able to infer entanglement between the two, between the two particles induced by this, by this indirect, indirect mechanism and this say, um, mechanism mediating their interaction. Uh, say uh, peculiarly, what happens is that if you release the two the two particles, uh, the way you allow the two, so if instead of trapping them in harmonic potential and letting them interact, uh, you you release them and in, in, uh, following so to say the uh, the picture of the interferometer that I've illustrated in the first proposal, um, the amount of entanglement that you're able to generate between the two particles increases, and this is induced basically by an enhanced interference of the wave packets between the two between the two the two particles so the spreading of the wave function when you release the two particles is is um, uh, help is, is facilitated um, with respect to the case when the two particles are um, uh, doesn't matter um, uh, um, uh, are trapped and now very briefly uh, just illustrating other possible other possible um, 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 tests along the lines of what I've illustrated there are instances where people have been interested in uh, characterizing the potential non-classical nature of the gravitational potential uh, by seeing if, for instance, there is an effect on a on a uh, superposition of so on the basically uh, if the field that would be generated by a coherent superposition would deviate by the field generated by a classical admixture of masses. And what studies have, no, the studies reported in this slide have, 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 have revealed is that indeed uh, there is a difference between um, the situation in which a quantum superposition of spatially delocalized states of mass, say, of mass basically, spatially delocalized masses, um, um, generates a quantum superposition of gravitational potential, or so a linear comp combination of fields, or an admixture. Okay, so. Uh, a probe particle in this diagram, S2, would feel a different effect whether the gravitational potential generated by a linear combination, a coherent superposition, or spatially delocalized states of a massive particle, or, um, uh, or I instead consider a statistical admixture of the two. In the semi-classical approach, so if I, if I allow only for, for um, uh, basically a classical description of the gravitational potential, S2 fields the potential generated by an average, an average mass, mass distribution. While in the case which um, um, uh, see, I, 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 I have an effect induced by the, by the uh, linear superposition of, 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 of masses being spatially separated, um, I feel a combination of effects of the gravitational potential generated by particle B and particle, so in, induced by particle B and par particle B, state beta and state alpha. And again, you can measure that through an optomechanical, an optomechanical setting. I'm not, um, uh, uh, I, I'm not, um, I'm not digging into into the, the 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 details of the experiment or the of the thought experiment. The idea is indeed to prepare a spatial superposition of particle S one in this diagram that induces a potential, a, say, a gravitational interaction with an S two in the cavity, and through the light field of the cavity, inferring the possible, the possible effects. The effect are striking, again, um, uh, if I look at the noise affecting the cavity field, in the semi-classical picture, I get a Gaussian. So uh, this is the diagram that you see in the left-hand side. So this is the response, basically, is the noise, the noisy response of the cavity field um, to probing at, even, at, give, at different frequencies. In the uh, quantum, uh, allegedly quantum scenario, this Gaussian is, uh, it's actually a Lorentz, sorry, this, um, this, this distribution is affected by the emergence of a secondary peak, a sideband peak, um, that um, shows the effect of the, of the um, coherent superposition, uh, the coherent superposition of the effects of interaction due to gravity. Okay, with that, I think my time, so the seven minutes that, that Yarek kindly, kindly allowed me to make use of are gone. These are the guys that uh, suffer my tantrum in Belfast. 
Um, these are the people that put, or the, the, the bodies that put bread on our, on our table. I thank you for your, for your patience and your, your, your endurance, and I'm uh, more than happy to take, to take your question if there is any. Okay, Mauro, thank you very much for, uh, for a very nice, uh, nice talk. Um, it has been a pleasure to, to uh, hear My the pleasure. summary of these results. And now, well, let's open, uh, let's open questions and, and discussions okay. part. May I have a question? Of course, of course, uh, Professor Białyniewski Birula. Hello, hello. About your proposal to test the quantumness of gravity. You seem to rely on a theorem that quantum entanglement cannot be produced by classical interactions. Yes? Yes, indeed. Okay, so let me give you a counterexample. Let's take two quantum electrons described by, say, Dirac equation. And at the beginning, the wave function is a product wave function. Then these electrons are accelerated, they start moving. And let's suppose that photons do not exist, but these moving charges exchange classical waves because they are accelerating. Therefore, the wave function after a while will not be a product, it will be entanglement, which will be present. And there is no need to assume the quantumness of the electromagnetic field. Okay, uh, this is a, uh, thank you for your, for, your, for your remark. I mean, this is a, um, um, a, 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 a very, a very well debated, a very well debated point, and uh, and a very well um, um, heated, <laughs> heated point. Uh, let me let me just stick to the context of uh, uh, of of my theorem, and this is a completely I say. Uh, uh, un, uh, I I don't want to be poly polemic on that. So what I'm what I'm what I'm simply saying is that. If you stick to the uh, general condition of the situation that I've illustrated, uh, the only way in which you can establish entanglement between, between these two, between two non-interacting particles is for them, is for them uh, to be interacting with a quantum, with a quantum system. So um, what's wrong with my example? Uh, it might not be fitting with the uh, it might not be fitting with the general conditions that I have uh, that I have uh, I have established that that I established in that in that in that paper or in that in that theorem. So more than happy uh, more than happy to dig into into uh, I'm I'm not saying that your example has anything wrong. What I'm saying is that if you stick to the general terms and condition of the theorem. Um, it's an if and only if situation. It's an if and only if statement that claims that um, there is no possibility for entanglement gain without any any classicality, as as characterized as characterized. I stress it by the uh, uh, non-orthogonal the, the need for non-orthogonal component in the state of the of the mediating system. So the fact that the wave function is not a product is not a measure of entanglement. The fact that the wave function is not a product uh, is not a measure. I'm not saying that. No, I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that um, I'm not in a in um, on my on my feet. I'm not in a position to ascertain whether or not your situation fits into the into into the the assumptions of the general framework that I have I have illustrated. Okay. Uh... Thank you very much for this nice exchange of, uh, of questions. Uh, any more? Uh, may I? I of course, Professor Kijowski, Jerzy Kijowski. I don't understand your uh, answer, excuse me, but uh, um, I would like to comment that I think there is no gravity in these examples which you have discussed because um, exactly. there is actually no uh, this uh, physical system which you call C, each, uh, and we, uh, which you would like to call uh, gravity, because gravity is, as far as I understand, gravitational field. It is a physical system, and if you replace it by the uh, Newton potential between two uh, points, then this is just a direct. Um, <laughs> Uh, interaction between A and B, and where is gravity? I don't see gravity here. 
yeah again so the uh, th thank you for your thank you for your question the uh, uh, the uh, the example is an illustration of a, of a, of of a mechanism suppose again that you have uh, particles that are uh, isolated enough to uh, ascertain or to exclude the possibility for any any other any other possible direct interaction but gravity Okay, uh, then the, the the general framework that is put in the that is put forward in this in this context will tell you that if you measure a um, uh, uh, entanglement gain between the two particles and you have excluded or you have been able to calibrate to calibrate the effect of the other of other possible interactions so that you know um, the effect that they would have. In the uh, in the dynamics of the two of the two probing particles, so if you either calibrate that effect or you are able to exclude it altogether, then these will have to uh, will have to push you towards the towards the conclusion um, gra gravity gravity uh, which was the only mechanism mediating the interaction is is non classical. Okay. Um... If I if I may borrow, so then if I if I understand, because of course if you look at the um, uh, theoretical um, descriptions of uh, of uh, the experiment the experiments that you have been talking about, they look exactly like uh, Professor Kiyowski said. There is no gravity. There is just uh, there is just uh, um, Coulomb uh, potential. Not so necessarily. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. I, I, not necessarily. I uh, I think the uh, the general say the general the general context is the general context that people are pushing for is to to make uh, to make no assumption at all on the uh, on the description that gra say on the description of the gravitation of the gravitational interaction. So no assumption behind it. Uh, so it's not necessarily not necessarily just just uh, a direct uh, uh, Newtonian gravity interaction. Ah, okay, okay. At least what I have seen, okay, then, then, then maybe I, well, obviously I haven't seen it all, but what, what I have seen was assuming a uh, simple... Uh, no, not necessarily. If you, Newtonian if you potential, see... But if I, if, no. I may, if I may continue, uh, uh, sure. but then what, what you are saying that, okay, perhaps this uh, description, or at least in the papers where they use uh, simple uh, Coulomb type potential, perhaps this is uh, far from being uh, realistic. But what you are saying is that let's not care too much about how we describe the interacting medium. Uh, if we are able to detect entanglement, and if we are within your assumptions, then the only conclusion is that there must be uh, there must be at least discord. So there must be non-orthogonal states. Yes. Yeah, so what you are saying that okay, perhaps our our description or, 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 or people who try to describe it using just the Newtonian uh, potential are making a very big oversimplification, which is, which is obvious because you are basically killing everything <clears throat> apart from the, 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 the Gaussian constraint of the gravity. Uh, but you are saying, okay, let's not care about that. Whenever I have entanglement, uh, then Based on your theorem, if you are within the assumptions, you have non orthogonal states. This is Absol what I absolutely, understand. absolutely, uh, absolutely, um, uh, absolutely true. The, uh, I, the this is what say the premise or the, the, the disclaimer I made when I said I'm not in necessarily interested in making any assumption on the mechanism, I don't need it, say. Uh, on the mechanism that mediates the interaction between A and B. If I'm able to, uh, if I'm able to isolate uh, all the possible, calibrate all the possible connections or interactions between the two particles, then if I measure an entanglement, an, entang an entanglement gain, and I'm within the framework that I have established, then my conclusion must be that entangle that the entanglement is induced is induced by by the two, by the two, uh, by by the gravitational interaction. Okay. Uh, okay. Are there any more questions? Maybe the last question about uh, your futuristic example of trying to assess a quantum a net of biological sample. Uh, I have a problem with this example because even if we perform such experiment. 
we know that these biological samples, they are made of uh, atoms. And yes. we also know that even if I put any actually medium to the cavity, uh, due to quantum, uh, quantum origin of the refractive index, there will be always some sure. entanglement in the output field. So what I assess actually- this Not necessarily design. always. It, not, 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 not necessarily always. I mean, the paradigm that these guys working in the in the biological uh, sorry, in the quantum nature of biological di dynamics make is that of the of the wet and warm environment, right? So where uh, you would expect, I mean, the sort of operating temperatures so of these of these of these of these systems um, is is such that any uh, any feature, any non-classical non -classical feature will be, will be washed out. So the, uh, the idea, I, so in a, in a naive manner, they would say uh, uh, that the, the conclusion that you would ascertain is, well, the operating conditions are such that uh, uh, no non-classical feature could be, could be, could be seen. Uh, and, and, and the operation of these biological, biological systems does not require does not require any 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 non classical any non classical feature. Yet, um, say the uh, the um, um, conclusions that you would, uh, and I'm not getting into, and I don't want to get into the into into a discussion on whether or not whether or not the claim is correct, okay, or, or the claim the claim is legitimate. Um, what I'm stating is that if you are interested in ascertaining in ascertaining whether the operation of uh, that specific biological sample um, requires elements of non-classicality at some time in the dynamics of this cavity, cavity matter system, then you will be able to do that through the, uh, through the, uh, through the, 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 the possible revelation of an, entanglement of, of, an, of an entanglement gain between cavity field, cavity field modes. What you, are going to, um, um, what you are going to conclude from that is the possibility that that biological sample at the operating temperature that these guys have, have uh, implemented in, the, in, 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 in their experiment um, needs an element of no classicality as entailed by, non by, 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 quantum, by quantum disco. Thanks. That's actually still difficult to assess what, even if there is some I've lost rate your, of entanglement. I've lost your question, I'm sorry. Uh, I, apologize, I apologize, I've lost your question, I think. Uh, okay, no, no, it's, I think, more or less you address that, but still I have problem then to assess what is entangled, well, what is non-classical in the sample? Are these atoms or it's on, on the larger spatial scale? It's, uh, okay, 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 yes. Uh, see, the description of... Um, the description of the biological sample that you give is that of a collective system. So you, you are not looking, uh, I, I, I think I see, now, I see now what you were asking. You are not looking at the granularity of the composition of the biological sample. I'm not able to ascertain quantumness at that level. What I'm uh, able to ascertain is the effect, the effect that the interaction with light has at the level of the vibration, the vibration of the structure, not the, co the collective modes of of uh, of motion of the of the of the biological sample within the within the within the within the within the sample. So somehow they behave as a collective system that collectively absorbs light and re-emit it in a collective in a in a in a in a collective manner. Is uh, nothing else but the description of um, if you want now if you if you're familiar with that with the Tevis Cummings model in a sense with a multiple with a multi-mode with a multi-mode cavity. Uh, we have a question from Jerzy Kijowski, Professor Kijowski, please. Uh, please unmute, please unmute, Professor Kijowski, please unmute the mic. It's good. Yeah, yeah. Now it's good. Yeah, yeah. Now it's good. Let me uh, make a, a short comment about the fundamental question of, of your talk, namely whether gravity has to be quantized or something like that. So, what is sure is that the present theory of gravity and the present theory of quanta or quantum theory are incompatible. Therefore, something must be done. Some people call this something quantization of gravity. 
However, despite of many years of, of really serious efforts, we are absolutely unable to say what, how should it behave this quantum gravity. Maybe the answer lies in a completely different direction. However, something has to be done. Thank you. I fully agree with your with your comment, uh, uh, and uh, and I think I think is, this is indeed, um, in a way or another, uh, in a way or another, what um, what people are trying, uh, what people are trying to to do. And and we might disagree on the on the methodologies, but I, I think we uh, uh, say the common goal is the same. And I, well, I, 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 I fully I fully agree with you. I would say that if uh, if the efforts to quantize the gravity has uh, failed, then it's quantum mechanics, perhaps that should be looked at. Yeah? It's sure. one one uh, one possibility. Uh, if I if I may uh, torture you a little bit more, Mauro, I, I yeah. have uh, I have one one uh, perhaps last uh, uh, question related to the question of uh, Professor Białynicki Birula. So there are these uh, these ideas of. Uh, um, entanglement generated via completely classical uh, media, for example, the ones put by um, Hall and, and uh, Reginato in the um, uh, ensemble, they, they have been developing this, this ensemble approach, uh, where, where they explicitly show that within their approach, you can, with a perfectly classical, at least according to the medium, you can, you can generate uh, non, uh, non separable or non factoring wave functions which are, which are entangled. So, um, my question to you would be uh, how do they fail to, to comply with your, uh, your, I went, your yeah, yeah, I, I went to, uh, yes, 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 uh, uh, we, we, we were familiar with all and Reginato's argument. And if you go into, um, into the details of the argument, at some point you need the assumption of non-commutativity between observable. To me, that is enough to state uh, that the, okay. to, to me, this is enough to state that you need quantum mechanics to describe what they sure, are. Or sure, at least even, even in classical sector, right? So, so they need non-commutativity. They, the, they need the... non-commutativity. Uh, and that, to, to, me, at, to me, that is sufficiently, a sufficiently strong argument to claim that uh, to claim that uh, that that you are beyond a, a, a genuinely classical framework and and this breaks down but 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 you mean non commutativity in the because they have several sectors classical and quantum and they are, it's all in there it's it's all there so mm -hmm. if you if you dig into the calculation uh, they 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 need uh, we had with an exchange of, of, of emails with them mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and they acknowledge it in 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 their in their so in 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 the, in, in in some of the replies indeed uh, it's it's a subtle point it's a very subtle point and it's a beautiful construction that they make but they exactly. in, they they uh, um, they require that at some point in the description okay 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 I will look then again at at, at the papers. Okay. I am. Um, I'm terribly sorry, but I have a lecture in five minutes. If I can, <laughs> we'll let you go. I think. I think. Thank we'll let you very you go. much. Thank you very much, uh, Mauro. Has Thank you for your pleasure time. Pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Mauro. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Carol. Bye. Thank bye. you. Thank you.